Hello, class. Okay, so we're going to talk about magnetic fields. And there's kind of two fundamental questions about this topic. You know, one is, uh, like, where do magnetic fields come from? Like, what are they? And another thing is, you know, what do magnetic fields actually do? And we're going to go about this kind of backwards, where we're going to focus on what magnetic fields do. Later on, we'll talk about where they come from. But for now, we're going to assume the existence of a magnetic field and just talk about the effects of that. So magnetic fields, these are vector fields. So let's say we have, like say at some point in space, there is a magnetic field, which we represent as a, as a vector. And we use uh, B for magnetic fields. And uh, just historically, that's the way it goes. And so what effect does this have? And the answer is that magnetic fields can exert forces on moving charges. So let's actually write that down. Magnetic fields can exert forces on electric charges. But first, let's talk about the magnetic field itself. You know, one fundamental question is what unit do we use for magnetic fields? And the SI unit for magnetic field is a Tesla. Which is, of course, named after Elon Musk's car. Now, this is a much older unit. Uh, it was named after Nikola Tesla. And, you know, that's the basic SI unit. Now, there is another system of units that was kind of the standard back in like the 1960s. And uh, the unit there was the Gauss. The unit for magnetic field in that system was called the Gauss, named after Carl Friedrich Gauss, remember Gauss's law. And uh, there's a conversion factor between Gauss and Tesla. So 10 to the 4th power Gauss is 1 Tesla. And the reason I mention this, even though it's not our SI unit, there's two reasons. One, you might see these around if you just read, because they are very commonly used. And uh, one reason Gauss is still used is because we're going to see 1 Tesla is actually a very large magnetic field. So let's look at some examples of magnetic fields. I'll draw that again later. Uh, just rough numbers. If we're in interstellar space, magnetic field is somewhere around 10 to the minus 10 Tesla. So that's like not even in our solar system if you're out between stars, you know, extremely weak magnetic fields. Uh, the surface of the Earth and again, it can depend on where you are, but generally it's around 10 to the minus 4 Tesla or 1 Gauss. So that's kind of a good enough reason to mention Gauss. Uh, it's easy to remember that on the surface of the Earth, the magnetic field is around one Gauss. And uh, if you look at like an ordinary bar magnet, it would be around 10 millitesla. So, uh, yeah, it's like one one hundredth of a Tesla. So, uh, yeah, like uh, one Tesla magnetic field, you're not going to get something that strong from a bar magnet. Now, you could get that from an electromagnet. And again, when we talk about where magnetic fields come from, 
Ultimately, they come from electric charts. So, or just more generally, just moving charges. And so, you can create a magnet with wires and run a current through it. That's called an electromagnet. And yeah, that could give you a magnetic field. Um, and again, this would be a large electromagnet. And again, it's not just running current through a wire. You can make a loop of wire, like wind it around, and then put like an iron core in it that would greatly uh, enhance the magnetic field. So you could get something, it would be a large electromagnet, would be like one Tesla. And then one more, uh, just for fun. Uh, oh yeah, two, two more. A superconducting magnet. Maybe get around five Teslas. And that is an enormous magnetic field. Something that might be in that range would be an MRI machine. I think MRIs are typically around three Teslas, but some go up to five or maybe even six. And again, the higher you go, the greater the magnetic field, the more resolution. You can get better pictures with the MRI. But again, you have to be more careful with these large magnetic fields. These are extremely large. And it's kind of amazing that this does not have an effect because you do have metal in your body, like iron in your blood. But you can handle very large magnetic fields. The human body can. But if you have, like, any jewelry that responds to magnetic fields, you definitely want to remove that. Um, it can be very dangerous. I know of one fatality involving an MRI where somebody accidentally entered the room carrying one of those oxygen canisters because it was in a hospital and that canister just flew towards the machine carrying the person with it and just crushed them against the machine. So these, uh, these magnetic fields are extremely strong. So uh, an MRI, you know, Typically, I think around three Teslas. And uh, well, a more extreme example, surface of a neutron star. So what is a neutron star? Um, basically, it's kind of like it sounds. It's a star made out of neutrons. So normal stars like our sun, uh, you know, this electrons are, it's a plasma where it's so energetic that the electrons can't be confined to a particular atom, but the sun is mostly, you know, electrically neutral, same number of protons and neutrons. And uh, the, the electrons just, you know, free to move around to some extent. And, uh, it, there's pressure that keeps a star from collapsing. Various kinds of pressure, uh, mostly heat. And uh, when a star kind of has a collapse, it can get to a point when a star collapses that the electrons uh, pretty much go like into the nuclei of the atoms. And so a neutron star you basically, if you look at what's going on inside, they're just like the nuclei of the atoms, like right next to each other. There's no gaps between them. It's an extremely, extremely dense star. And the magnetic field on the surface of a neutron star, somewhere around 10 to the eighth power Tesla. So that is an extremely large magnetic field. All right. So these are just some typical values. Good thing to remember, surface of the Earth, one Gauss, 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. All right, now we want to talk about what magnetic fields do. I said they can exert forces on electric charges. So let's say we have our magnetic field here. And I said it can exert a force. It doesn't necessarily do so. Because if you have a charge sitting here, so here's a charge, uh, there's going to be no magnetic force on this charge if it's just sitting there. The charge has to be moving 
in order uh, for there to be a magnetic force. So let's give it a velocity. And if the charge is moving in a region with a magnetic field, there is probably going to be a force on it. However, um, let's look at, there's two questions when we talk about magnetic force. What is the magnitude of the force and what is the direction? So let's focus on the magnitude of the force. To start out with the, mag the magnitude of the force, let's call it Fb. For a magnetic force, that's going to be perpendicular to the charge. So if you have twice as much charge, twice as much force. Uh, it's also perpendicular to the magnetic field. Again, it makes sense. Magnetic fields exert forces on charges. You have twice the charge, you get twice the force. It's also proportional to the velocity. That one's actually a little bit strange, but uh, let's just go with that for now. Uh, maybe later on we'll talk about why that's a little bit strange, because it depends on velocity. But there's one more factor that, uh, that comes into play here when we're talking about magnetic force, and that is the direction. It depends on the angle between the velocity, like the direction the particle's moving relative to the magnetic field. And we can look at two special cases. Let's look at case one, where we have a magnetic field in this direction. And the force, we'll say, it, or the velocity, is parallel to the magnetic field. We could have just as well said anti-parallel. So they're along the same line, but you know, the field's pointing to the right, velocities to the left, you know, same thing. And in this case, the magnetic force is going to be zero. So that's why I said, you know, it can exert a force on a moving chart or just on an electric charge. So it requires velocity, but still the direction has to play a role. So it has to be moving in the right direction, or which is anything other than parallel or anti-parallel. Uh, let's look at another case. Let's say we have our magnetic field in this direction. And let's say the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And in this case, the magnetic force is just going to be QVB. And again, that's just the magnitude of the force. So if we have a negative charge, if you plug in you know, negative Q, you get a negative, just forget about plugging in the minus sign. We're just looking at the magnitude, so that's a positive value. So if the velocity and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, then we just get this direct relation, F is QVB. Now, what if the velocity is in a different direction? Again, we don't really need anything new here. Let's look at case three. I'll just erase this. So case three is a more general case where we have a magnetic field. And now the velocity is not parallel or anti-parallel. But again, we don't really need anything new in this case because we can break velocity into components. Or alternatively, we could break the magnetic field into components. Um, but either way, uh, this component of velocity Maybe do better because it, the particle is actually moving in one direction. Let's break the magnetic field into components instead. Again, either way works, but uh, I'll draw the same picture. So if the magnetic field's actually in this direction, we can break it up into components, where one component is. Okay, let's. 
So the magnetic field is going to have a component in the direction of velocity and also a perpendicular component. And uh, let's say theta is the angle between velocity and magnetic field. So again, we can break up the magnetic field into these two components. And this component is not going to exert any force on this charge because they're parallel. So it's only this component. And again, this component is B sine of theta. The perpendicular component of the magnetic field is B sine of theta. Uh, this component is adjacent to the angle, that's cosine. This one's in that direction, opposite. And so, in general, I'll write the result down here. We can say the magnetic force, the magnitude of the magnetic force, is QBB sine of theta. So again, that component does nothing. So we have uh, just this case now, except instead of B, we have B sine of theta. So when it comes to talking about the forces on uh, moving charges, we're halfway done. Unfortunately, it's the easy half. Uh, we found the magnitude. It's easy because all we have to do is say QVB sine of theta, you know, just plugging in numbers. We have a simple formula. But now let's talk about the direction of the uh, magnetic force. So I'm going to clear this board. Okay, so let's look at one special case that's not going to be very interesting. So say our magnetic field pointing to the right. And let's say the velocity is parallel to the magnetic field or anti-parallel, doesn't matter. The magnetic force in that case is zero. And as far as the direction, who cares? It, it doesn't exist, so we don't care about the direction. So let's say that in cases where a magnetic field actually exists, that's the only time we care what direction it is, we can say that the velocity is not parallel to the magnetic field. So it's going to make an angle. Now, you could say, well, there's actually two angles here. We have this angle between up here, or what about this angle between V and B? Well, we always pick one that's between 0 and 180 degrees. That's always possible. So we're always going to have one between 0 and 180 and one you know, between 180 and 360. So we just pick the one between 0 and 180, the smaller angle, to uh, that one we call theta. And these two vectors form a plane. So the only plane that both of these two vectors exist is this board. Yeah, if they were parallel, then, you know, you could have multiple planes. They don't uniquely define it, but uh, we don't have to consider that case anyways. So if a magnetic force exists, the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector form a plane and the force is perpendicular to this plane. So perpendicular, uh, it's like coming out of the board, or maybe it's going into the board. So there's two possibilities, and we need to determine which of these two possibilities it is. Like, is a force going to be, let's say this is an actual charged particle moving in this field, is a force going to be out of the board or into the board? And to do that, we use something called the right-hand rule. So, obviously, you, you use your right hand for this. And uh, the way it works, there's actually different ways it's described. I like this kind of active approach to it. So what that means, uh, you start out by putting your fingers in the direction of the velocity. So 
Now again, you could rotate your hand multiple ways where your fingers are pointing in the direction of velocity, but then what you do is you curl your fingers towards the magnetic field. So in this case, my hand is oriented this way, I curl towards the magnetic field, and then my thumb is pointing into the board. So in this case, the right hand rule gives you a direction. And if we look at uh, another case, let's say we have a magnetic field like this. And let's say the velocity is in this direction. So again, the right hand rule gives us a direction. What direction is it? Well, we have to place our fingers in the direction in a way that we can curl them towards a magnetic field. So that would be like this, and then thumb is pointing out of the board. So the right hand rule, in this case, is out of the board. And again, this might seem strange, magnetic fields are actually kind of strange. Uh, it's all because it depends on the velocity, which is an unusual thing. Uh, but uh, well, that's how they work. And again, it's something that you just have to get used to. Now, okay, so the right hand rule gives us a direction. What does that tell us? The right hand rule, I'm going to write this over here. That gives you the direction of the force. on a positive charge. So let's say in this case, let's say this was a positive charge. The right hand rule is pointing into the board because it's a positive charge, that would be the direction of the force, the magnetic force. So that'd be into the board. Let's say, what if it's a negative charge? Let's look at this case. Say we have a negative charge moving like this. And so the right hand rule points um, out of the board. So again, V, curl your fingers, kind of an unusual way to orient yourself. But yeah, right hand rule gives a direction which is out of the board. But because it's a negative charge, the force would be in the opposite direction. And so um, there's, yeah, I mean, that's really it. It's just something that you definitely want to practice and get used to. And then, uh, yeah, that gives you the direction of the magnetic force. And this right-hand rule, this is really not something that's going away. You have to learn this because it's going to keep showing up from now on. Okay, now one more thing. Um, another way you could do this. Like I said, if you have a negative charge, use the right hand rule and just reverse the direction. There's another way you could do it and just say use your right hand for positive charges and left hand for negative charges. So if I use my left hand here, um, well, it's going to be inconvenient. So I have to orient it like this and curl in the direction of the magnetic field. And then my thumb points in the end of the board. And again, that is the direction of the force. So you can use either way you want. You can just always use your right hand rule and remember to check the charge. Uh, if it's a negative charge, just reverse that direction. Or you could just use your left hand for negative charges. You get the same thing, so it's just a preference which way you like doing that. Okay, now there's a way we can summarize all of this information into one very compact equation. And this is by using cross products. So I'm going to break down the equation. So if you remember uh, cross products, when you take V cross B, the vector that results from that is perpendicular to the plane formed by V and B. So just general math. 
We don't even have to look at applications like this. So let's look at, uh, yeah, like in this case, V cross B, that's going to be pointing into the board. Let's actually, uh, let's see if we can show this. Let's say this is the XY coordinate system here. And uh, we'll say B. is equal to just bx in the x direction. Where v is in the xy plane, so we'll have vx in the x direction plus vy in the y direction. Uh, I use like x hat, y hat for the x and y directions. Uh, it's also ij, so I use xyz. You can also use ijk. Same thing, just different notation. So if we formally carry out this cross product, um, let's do that. Let's write this as a determinant. I don't want to erase this. I'll see if I can fit it here. Let's just look at V cross B. So we make a vector. We have X, Y, Z, or I, J, K, if you like. And then V, we have VX, VY, and zero. Uh, here we have VX, zero, and zero. So basically the X component is going to be zero. So we have the X component times this determinant formed by this two by two matrix here. So that's VY times zero minus zero times zero. And then minus Y hat, so now we have the determinant formed by these elements uh, where we cross off the Y column. So we have VX times zero minus zero times VX. That's also zero. And then plus Z hat, where we have this determinant, which is VX times zero minus VY VX. And remember that uh, these components here are all positive because like B is in the positive X direction. Uh, v is a positive X and a positive Y component. And so if we just kind of formally take the dot product, we'll get the, um, you know, we'll get a vector pointing into the board, which is what the right hand rule is giving us. And uh, again, we could do the same for this case. Let's do that. Basically, the only difference here is that the V components would both be negative. And we should get something out of the board in this case. So here we have minus and minus. So again, these components are still going to be zero. So if we look at the Z component, we're going to have minus VX times zero. That's zero. And then minus minus vy of x, And so again, if we just take the cross product of these two by writing it in this determinant form, you know, we get a vector coming out of the board. So this cross product gives us the right direction. Now, what about the force? Here, because we had a negative charge, the force is into the board. Well, we're multiplying by q. And in this case, q is negative. So if you take a vector that's out of the board and multiply it by a negative number, you flip it over. So like if you have, say, vector A, then vector minus A is just pointing in the opposite direction. And so this gives us the right uh, magnitude and direction in every case. Much more compact way of writing it. And if you want to check to see if you get the right direction, again, you have VX and let's look at this example. Uh, yeah, we could say that VX and VY, VY is V sine theta. So if we define the angle to be between the velocity vector and the magnetic field, VY is V sine theta. So if we go back to the first example, just because that's easier to see, 
um, what we get is minus V sine theta times B in the Z direction. And that's just V cross B. So if we multiply by Q, Q V cross B, let's put the sine theta at the end. We have uh, Q times V sine of theta B. So we can end this all negative. And so, um, yeah, we get the magnitude QV V sine of theta, but using this cross product, we also get the direction, you know, minus Z direction. So a positive charge, Q is positive, we don't reverse the direction. And so we get something pointing into the board. Remember the right hand, the, we, we have to use a right-handed coordinate system here. So, for a right-handed coordinate, x hat cross y hat equals z hat. Use a right-hand rule, x curl your fingers in the y direction, positive z is pointing out of the board. So negative z is into the board. And, uh, yeah, so again, this is kind of more convenient in some cases, but it depends on what you're doing. Uh, I kind of like having the magnitude and direction separately, and it is essential to know the right-hand rule. Uh, you don't want to have to write down this matrix and carry out the cross product all the time just to figure out what the direction of the force is. You really should know the right-hand rule, and also, you know, you have to make sure that you have your coordinate system right, which kind of requires the right-hand rule as well. So there's no way around the right-hand rule. Okay, so that is the magnetic force on a moving charge. Uh, yeah, and uh, later we'll talk about applications of that. That would be a good place to stop here.